All right, so I'm going to wrap it up right here. We have today gone through uh, the articles, the Harvard basis for the story and the life history of William Sidus. We've connected that into the popular movie from 1998, Good Will Hunting, and its authors, Ben Affleck and Matt Damon. We've taken that story back to real life to connect William Sidus, who is Good Will Hunting, uh, to his, uh, his dad, Boris Sidus, his mom, uh, Sarah Sidus, both uh, psychologists at Harvard, and uh, the mistreatment through their intentional uh, neglect or in unintentional neglect, you want to put it, um, their ineffective ethics. They try to do good, but it has ill effects on their son. Um, and he grows up to write a book that is recognized by recognized geniuses decades later as being a substantial contribution many years ahead of its time. So why does someone like that then find themselves in kind of a lackluster rest of their life of menial jobs and struggle to find any sort of success and thrive in the world when clearly they're one of the most intelligent people ever to walk the earth? Could it be that some of those uh, contradictions hold people up regardless of intelligence? The learned helplessness, even though you could be a smart learner, you might not be able to learn how to make yourself successful in a system that already exists. So there's uh, adapt, evolve, overcome abilities of resourcefulness. There's work ethic that if it's not being externally pushed, maybe Sidus didn't have a whole lot of motivation without two parents poking and prodding him to do stuff. Maybe he never had that internal self uh, resourcefulness faculty or Maybe he did have that, and that's how he was able to, you know, give a middle finger to MIT and say, I'm not going to work for the government, giving you the solutions to questions you guys can't answer. So you can go kill people on the other side of the world and, like, drain the economy and resources out of this country. Why should he do that, right? That's the Club of Baby Seal scene. And so bringing that all full circle. All right. Howdy, howdy, howdy. We are live Wednesday afternoon, 4.30 this time. All right, so uh, before we get started with today's deep dive into some interesting uh, mainstream culture, alternatives to mainstream culture, you know, things that exist in mainstream but aren't really reported up to today, so people maybe back in the day knew about them, and then some things maybe that have been off all of our radar that we'll learn uh, through today's endeavor. Um so last thing first, last week, same time, other studio, uh, we did a Smart Reads episode on uh, The Witness Tree, which is a novel by researcher John Loftus. And that's going to be released tomorrow night on YouTube, so it'll premiere live 7 p.m. So for those of you watching this live on Wednesday, that premieres tomorrow night. Uh, YouTube, if you're watching this on YouTube, we'll get to you in a second. Uh <laughs> So that's the uh, the premiere from the Wednesday shows are one week and a day behind. So they get out to the real world. You guys get to see them live and people in between in the autonomy course of action. They get to see them as they're posted to the curriculum, if that's not con too confusing. So now let's break that down. Those of you who are watching this live or in a replay in the autonomy course of Breakthrough Actions, there are many new students. I wanted to first make the point that this is not part of the course. This is not mandatory. These sessions on Wednesday are purely for advanced applications of autonomy, people who are working on their active literacy skills, uh, like myself and other people who participate in the show. And then um, we do it live for ourselves. I then make it available on YouTube. So those of you who are seeing this on YouTube, that's how this, uh, this show unfolds. It films every other week and on the same time slot every other Wednesday we do Smart Reads in the library studio where we examine books. And that brings us all up to speed with what we're going to get to uh, as far as housekeeping. Now we can move into today's endeavor. Let me turn around and show you the web pages that I have open. We're going to start with the core article from which uh, if you do some reading of that article and you were to dig into the fact of the article, it would yield these other tabs that open up across the internet browser. So we're going to start with an article that is from Harvard. It is a uh, publication from Harvard in 1989. And then we're going to dig into that, ask some questions about the person or persons who were talked about in that article. And uh, when we unfold it, the purpose is to learn about things which we thought we already knew. 
and then to learn beyond that boundary or that breakthrough point to where we're now adding new things that maybe people around us and, uh, you know, including ourselves, haven't come into contact with before. And from that perspective, we're left with something that's a, a, a valuable investment of time. And for me, this is part of the process that I do for myself when I learn new things. And this time slot, History Connected, uh, is where I take some of those things and I just illustrate them as I do it so that it provides value to you because if you learn to structure your information uh, in a more serious way then you can do more serious things out of those data sets uh, creativity wise uh, inventiveness wise uh, active literacies outputs into the world so it's not just input and processing it's also how do you express what you've learned to the world knowledge becomes wisdom only one shared that's the idea all right so let me turn around click a button i'm going to put the uh, web pages on screen first We'll take a look at what we'll see today and then we'll start f reading and then fitting it all together. All right, so the first article is from Harvard Magazine 1998. It is the March edition and it is titled Goodwill Citus. Unlike the title character in the film Goodwill Hunting, played and conceived by Matt Damon, graduate of 92. William James Sidus, graduate of 14, never swore, smoked, chug, chugged beer, or hit people. But like Will Hunting, young Bill Sidus had a photographic memory and an uncanny ability to solve abstruse mathematical puzzles. His IQ was stratospheric. At 18 months, he could read from the New York Times. At three, he was typing and teaching himself Latin and Greek. Before he was old enough to start school, he knew German, French, Russian, and Hebrew. The press discovered him at eight, when he was the world's youngest high schooler. He did not get much privacy after that. As an 11-year-old Harvard man, he was described in the Times as, quote, a wonderfully successful result of a scientific forcing experiment, end quote. In later years, when he was found doing menial clerical work, he was featured as an example of what could befall gifted children whose parents pushed them too hard. Sidus, the name rhymes with Midas, was born a century ago on April 1st, 1898. His parents were Ukrainian immigrants. His mother, Sarah, worked her way through Boston University's medical school. Boris Sidus, with a various number of degrees there with the years, his father was an early psychotherapist known for his work with hypnosis. William James, a friend and mentor to Sidus, was the baby's godfather. William James Sidus was named after William James. He would describe his namesake as the most remarkable prodigy he had ever encountered. Billy Sidus qualified for admission to Harvard at nine, but had to wait two years to matriculate as a special student. We'll also learn he passed the MIT qualification exam at age eight. That's not going to be mentioned in the Harvard article here. In his first year still in Knickers, he delivered a much publicized two-hour lecture on four-dimensional bodies. The audience, included math, ma <laughs> the audience included mathematicians from all over New England. As a sophomore, he roamed, he roomed for a time at the yard, in the yard, I'm sorry. As a sophomore, he roomed for a time in the yard, but was teased so remorselessly that his parents moved him to an apartment. The next year, he took seven courses. Some may have been too slow-paced for him, all told, he earned, uh, he earned 10 A's in math, physics, and French, 9 B's, and 4 C's. His A.B. was award, awarded cum laude. Quote, I want to live the perfect life, end quote. He was said to have told reporters at his graduation, quote, The only way to live a perfect life is to live it in seclusion. I have always hated crowds, end quote. But he couldn't escape the press. A teaching stint at Rice University came to grief because students mocked him. It was national news. Sidus enrolled at Harvard Law School, only to leave in his final semester. More notoriety. Drawn to the socialist movement, he was among the marchers arrested 
when police halted a May Day parade in 1919, setting off a melee. A Roxbury judge blamed Sidus for leading the march and set bail at $5,000. Classmate Leverett Sta uh, Saltonstall, a future governor of Massachusetts, took care of the bond. The case was eventually null prost, sparing Sidus a jail sentence. After that, according to Sidus, his father and mother abducted him and kept him under restraint for two years. What transpired, whatever transpired, he became estranged from his parents. In 1924, the New York Herald Tribune revealed that the boy brain prodigy of 1909 was now a $23 a week clerk in a New York business firm. As a back office calculator operator, he went from job to job for the rest of his life. Familiar with scores of languages, he also worked as a translator. After hours, he wrote, in 1925, he published The Animate and the Inanimate, advancing the theory of black holes 15 years before physicists and astronomers warned, warmed to it. The press, for once, paid no attention. An avid collector of streetcar transfers, Sidus brought out notes on the collection of transfers pseudonymously, 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 pseudonymously the next year. Amy Wallace's sympathetic biography, The Prodigy, published in 1986, called it, quote, arguably the most boring book ever written, end quote. Sidus also wrote science fiction, a long novel set in the lost continent of Atlantis and a two-volume history of America. All remain unpublished. Returning to Boston, Sidus got a small uh, South End apartment took clerical jobs, and went on with his writing. His few friends regarded him as content. His seclusion ended in August 1937 when the Boston Sunday Advisor and the New Yorker ran articles about him. The New Yorker piece bylined, quote, Jared L. Manley, but reworked by James Thurber, was titled, quote, April Fool, end quote. Sidus had enough. He sued both publications. The advertiser eventually settled for $375. In a breach of privacy suit against the New Yorker, the court ruled that Sidus could not claim privacy rights because he was still a public figure. In 1944, the magazine paid a reported $500 to settle a companion suit for malicious libel. Sidus died of a cerebral hemorrhage three months later. He was 46. The hero of Goodwill Hunting also lives in the South End and runs away from celebrity, but he receives, a, he receives helpful counseling from a caring psychiatrist, Robin Williams, and the love of a charming and rich Radcliffe student, Minnie Driver. Some guys get all the breaks. So that is the Harvard Magazine article from 1998. Is there more to learn? There's a lot more to learn. Are you guys ready? All right, so let's look into his dad. Who is Boris Sidus? Boris Sidus lived from 1867 to 1923. He was a Russian-born American psychologist noted in psychodynamics for his development and testing with William James of the 1890s reserve energy theory of accelerated mental development. Man. That's interesting. We're going to have to right-click open that. We need to know what reserve energy is. Might be pretty interesting. It's been going on a long time. And Boris used that technique on his son. That's how he had accelerated learning. That's interesting. Also interesting are the results of doing that forcibly on a child, which we're going to get into as well. Overview. In the 1890s, Boris Sidus began to develop the reserve energy theory of accelerated mental development with his mentor, William James. In 1898, his son, William Sidus, was born, and with him began to test out, in theory, James's reserve energy theory on the new child, the result of which became the most famous of all forced prodigy experiments. William Sidus would later go on to write, 1920, a treatise on life theorized by the operation of reserve energy acting on the part of Maxwell's demon. There is a footnote for that, so we're going to have to open that up. 
Education. At age 15 in Russia, Boris Sidis was locked in a body size cell for two years as punishment for teaching peasants to read. An act misconstrued as a conspiracy plot was released on the condition that he renounce all education. Left to America upon arriving at age 17, commented that, quote, when I first set foot in the Boston Public Library, I felt as though the gates of heaven had opened to me, end quote. In short, Sidus was primarily autodidactic. A significant, uh, significantly influence, however, was his Harvard PhD advisor, psychologist William James, to whom he named uh, his son after. There's a couple references. The reference comes back to 1986, The Prodigy, a biography of William James Sidus by Amy Wallace, a book that existed well before Goodwill Hunting. It was published maybe 10 years before it. Further reading, Boris Sidus, The Psychology of Laughter. There, uh, you can actually read more articles. There's an external link to Wikipedia if you wanted it. Um, this is the Encyclopedia of uh, Human Dynamics. And it has links to Maxwell's Demon. It has links to William Sidus. And then we're going to get into, from there, the movie was created by Damon and Affleck. Uh, original transcript, not credited as a true story. Uh, so we want to find out who these guys were that were so creative. And then we want to also check into William James' reserve theory, uh, reserve energy theory. Also, this is uh, Sidus 10% myth theory, which is interesting. And then take a quick look at the inanimate, or the animate and the inanimate. Sidus' book, he wrote it in 1920, it was published in 1925, and here it is. So those of you who would want to look at this later, uh, let me make it a little bit bigger. Uh, it's a PDF copy on the Sidus Family Archive website, which is also a pretty interesting place if you like to read. And then I wanted to pull down, this is a chapter from the book, and I wanted to go down to, where's the quote? Right about here. All right, cool. So now we're going to go back. All right, so there's the original magazine article. Now I'm going to shrink my browser screen, do it half screen. I'm going to bring up the brain model. Here's my history blueprint. Let me X out of Wikipedia's ads. I've already donated for the season. We don't need ads in this production. Harvard University is where we're going to start because we have an article from Harvard Magazine. So we're going to drop that. Bring that URL. Just drop it over here under Harvard University. And then we got a starting point. Oh, now the question is where to find that. Let's type it in. It should be in the title. There it is. Goodwill Citus. I'd like to go in here and I would like to, as you can see, the article embeds and it's scrollable at the bottom of the screen for the history blueprint. I just want to type Harvard Magazine. Ninety-eight. All right, there we go. We got an article. Now it's going to talk about people in the article. So let's go to our tabs. Let's find Boris. Let's put him in the model. Maxwell's demon. Now, over time, ultimately, <clears throat> I'd want to take more of these references from Wikipedia as I'm going to do for the rest of this. But since this article had such good linked information, ah, oh man. And you see, I'm going to have to rename all these to make sure that they are followable later. So let's go back here. Boris, which one's Boris? Boris. We'll just rename this real quick. Borisitis. It almost sounds like uh, some sort of disease, right? Borisitis. I'm sure he heard that while he was growing up. Or Borisitis. Now I could also write uh, psychotherapist after that, but no need right now. We're doing it live. I can go in and always touch up and clean up and polish. 
Maxwell's Demon. And above that, we're going to have to go to James Clerk Maxwell. There's his equations. There's the person. And thermodynamics. Put that in there. All right, so now if we go back over here to the article, let's see. All right, I'm going to clean this up, put these off to the side. These are all items in the article. They don't come as a result of the article. They're not causal. They're connected, uh, correlated to the side. All right, so now here's what we have. Harvard University, Harvard Magazine, 1998, Goodwill Citus. This also talks about the movie Goodwill Hunting. Uh, we're going to just drag it in like this. So from the Wikipedia, we're going to drag in Goodwill Hunting. And we're going to put that off to the side. We'll learn a little bit about that in a second. Let's go click Goodwill Hunting. This was a story conceived by Matt Damon and Ben Affleck <clears throat> in the official story. We'll learn about that. And then we also know Ben's got a brother, Casey. Let's just throw him in there because he's also in Goodwill Hunting. And we're going to take these as creators. So you drive the top down. It puts them up there. And we'll just put Casey off the side because he's in it but who knows what his creativity was. And let me bump that back down because I just moved it. Move this thought. You drag it around, you can resize it. If you grab the circle, you can make it bigger or smaller. All right. We have a film. Goodwill Hunting. Did we get it in here? Right there. Led to this article. And this is via 1989 or 1998. Now, I also want to connect that to here. All right, so under Harvard University, you also have Matt Damon. Where's Damon at? He didn't go there. Damon attended. Did not graduate very much like Sidus. We'll learn that in a second. We're going to read the Wikipedia page and let's go back. So, what else do we have? William James is connected into this article right here. So, we're going to talk William James. He's in there. So we got Boris, and we also need uh, Will Sidus, and I think he's right here. So let's, let's clean that up so it's easier to see. Then it still has the title of the article. All right. So now we're back to, we have an article, we have the ideas that are the main ideas in here. Let's also put reserve energy in here because uh, that's also in the article that we're going to talk about. 10% myth. And then let's rename those before we go too far. Reserve energy theory. And that was... 1890s it was put into play by the earth early 1900s who else has been using this idea that we just found out about a couple minutes ago i always ask that when i find out about stuff like this and then i'm going to link it back to william james all right reserve energy theory and that is part of psychology
we get more specific on that, but at least we have an idea what type of energy it is. And I will put the concept of energy attached to it because it is a subservient uh, type of energy. All right, so article, all the main themes that we're going to talk about. Did we get, uh, let's just put, uh, where's Sidus? And we'll have to see if he has a Wikipedia page because that would be better to link some of these two. But let's just put his book underneath him. Because the page we're going to see is very much like a Wikipedia page. Let's just rename this to make sure we can find it in the future. And then we'll say 1920. Sometimes no, I'll just say published 1925. Sometimes you remember one date or the other, and then you go searching, you can't find it. So I just like to put those notes, do it live, put it in there. So now we have the PDF, and we also have a subchapter of that, so I could drop that in here as well. And then we're back to having solid structure to remember the line of research that we needed to undertake to understand this article. And then you have a map to find it again easily in the future should you need to. So it starts with that article. The next place I want to go from that article is obviously I want to learn. After learning about Boris, let's learn about William Sidus. And then we'll get to Maxwell in a second. All right. This is the link that we're looking at. That way if we have to model some things in here. Uh, it could be pretty interesting. All right, so I'm going to start. Uh, Goodwill Hunting, William Sidus. In film trivia, Goodwill Hunting, the 1997 film about a Boston child prodigy, William Hunting, to a nearly 90% overlap, was based on the true life story of IQ 225 plus cited Boston Southie. William Sidus, 1898 to 1944, a Harvard trained, MIT working, war protesting, officer assaulting, FBI followed him, film CIA recorded, asylum inmate, child prodigy, lawyer, mathematician, physicist, who fell in, a, fell in love with a girl he met in jail, the film, he called the girl from jail, who was released from jail on the condition that he see a psychologist and in reality the conditional re re uh, release was he was released to his parents who were both psychologists who ran an insane asylum Boris Sidus so the the Oscar the Academy Award winning film the original screenplay by Affleck and Damon that uh, Damon went to Harvard people at Harvard know this story of William Sidus this is a very interesting overlay, and it's not taking anything away from them winning an Oscar 20 years ago for the film or whatever. I understand they could probably sell an original screenplay for more than they can a real-life story. Okay, that's how they made their careers. I'm interested in the story of the guy that we're not really told was a real person who really exists and who might really inspire you or might give you uh, some cautionary tale aspects of uh, the upsides of being smart and getting smarter and learning what to do with it and the struggle that he had and how to apply his intelligence to the world in a way that was constructive. So uh, let me just go to the next, next paragraph here. Overview. Sidus was a forced prodigy who became a mathematician, astrophysicist, lawyer, with an eidetic memory, who at age eight scored a hundred percent on the MIT entrance exam. Graduated from Harvard at age 16, was in Harvard Law School by age 17, and by the age of 21 was sentenced to 18 months in jail for assaulting an officer, but release on bail on the condition, uh, he, but was released on bail on the condition that he see a therapist who happened to be his father, Harvard psychologist Boris Sidus. So the article goes through, let me scroll to the middle so you can kind of see the pictures and the captions and these sort of things. That's a little bit better. 
In the film, the character Will Hunting was played by Harvard alumnus Matt Damon, who also co-wrote the script. The first article on the similarities between the two was published uh, the following year in Harvard Magazine, entitled Good Will Citus. The following bullets summarize some of the main similarities. So this is interesting. Now we're learning about something in pop culture, and we're learning about an individual who is a really interesting character in American history, especially when you look at the history of learning and the behavioral applications of the, the progressivists who were trying to do forced education and forced learning on people against their will. This is a really interesting confluence. Sidus scored perfect on the MIT entrance exam at age eight. Both Hunting and Sidus were Boston Southies. That's not correct because Sidus is from the South End and uh, Southies are from Boston, like South Boston, and they're not called Southies. So I would disagree with that and I would agree with uh, one of the gents in the comments said the same thing. Sidus, living out his post-MIT life in a small South End apartment, as did Hunting, in 1909, Sidus, age 11, lectured Harvard mathematics professors, as did Hunting, specifically on four dimensions, uh, presenting to the mathematical club. Let me see why I don't have enough of the screen on the screen. Let me just do this. Help me out. I oh, know. No. How about that? One more of those. There we go. We got all the words on the screen. Small wins. That's what it makes. All right. In 1919, at age 21, after spending two years in Harvard Law School, Sidus defended himself in court, getting the charges dropped. In 1919, age 21, Sidus was sentenced to 18 months in jail, six months for rioting, and a year for assaulting an officer. Both Hunting and Sidus uh, met. Uh, meet the life of their lives just before going to jail. The boring parts. Both Hunting and Sidus worked at MIT Labs, a condition of their parole. Both Hunting and Sidus spent the remainder of their life working menial clerical jobs. Sidus ends up going out to California following a period of psychological probation, just as does Hunting at the end of the movie to go see about a girl. Both Sidus, age 20, and Damon, age 22, dropped out during their last semester of coursework at Harvard, Sidus, while at Harvard Law. While in good academic standing, for no apparent reason, both failing to degree. Then it talks about, uh, it says, Matt Damon, Amy Wallace. To note, there does not seem to exist an actual published statement where Damon explicitly claims to have based the story on Sidus. In a 2010 interview, Damon says that the film started as a 40-page draft written in a playwriting class at Harvard, of which a couple of pages survived and made it into the film. This is weekly evidenced by an anonymous 2007 Wikipedia talk page, uh, talk page post by someone in the Seattle, Washington, who commented, I knew Matt when they were writing this script, and I remember the central character was based on a story that was circulating at the same time about someone. Yeah, well, I don't know if that's too credible. Uh, whom, the, whom the poster seems to recall as being someone from Yale? Question mark. The more than nearly two dozen coincidence similarities between Sidus and Hunting discussed herein, however, more than substantiate beyond doubt that the film was based on the life of Sidus at Harvard and MIT. What most likely occurred is that while a student at Harvard, during the years 1988 to 1992, Damon came across the infamous story of Harvard legend William Sidus, who famously had been on the cover of New York Times over 19 times for his intellectual abilities at MIT and Harvard, and in turn read the recently published 1986 book, The Prodigy, by biographer Amy Wallace. Wallace's book contains pictures, shown in this article, biographical depictions, and anecdotes of the main characters in Sidus's life, which fit precisely those of the characters in the film. Wallace's biography, in turn, is a continuation of an earlier 1976 through 79 uh, biographical researches by American political psychologist Dan Mahoney. The legal 
official uh, biographer of Sidus, who had been studying Sidus's writings and notes and attempts to write a biography on William Sidus and Boris, Boris Sidus. Mahoney is the curator of the 1999 site Sidus.net, a growing collected works, notes, and related writings of Sidus. Um, uh, a glowed, uh, uh, but there's misprints in the article. I'm trying to make my best around them. <laughs> Damon, having dropped out of Harvard one year away from completing an English degree, was betting his money on his acting screenwriting ability and would have thus intuitively been aware that a story ba uh, based on a true story movie would be less remark uh, less marketable than an original screenplay film of such a grand story as Sidus, albeit keeping the script origin secret inside secret so they have the story it's a true story and you tell the true story it's not worth as much but that they fictionalize a little bit academy award that's a good lesson right there how hollywood works that's how the industry works film title the film uh, the first name will no doubt is modeled on Will Sidus, or Bill, as he was called by his friends. The name William, in the naming of William James Sidus, is assigned to the honor, uh, in the honor of American psychologist William James, mentor to Boris Sidus at Harvard, and the originator of the reserve energy theory used in the accelerated mental raising of William Sidus. The surname Hunting may have come from numerous reports of how Sidus's parents spent their remaining life hunting him down after he escaped from their asylum in 1921. In, uh, in his Sidus's own re retrospect words, the parents resorted from time to time to various efforts to track him down and persuade his friends to turn him over. So to get him back to the, quote, old tortures, end quote. Physical abuse. The part in the film where the judge states that he is aware that hunting had been through several foster homes, experiencing severe physical abuse in, in some, uh, would likely again come from Sidus, uh, uh, from Sidus's published commentary on how he was railroaded into an asylum and afterwards moved from home to home in California and later Boston. During his year-long stay at the asylum, Sidus commented in retrospect that he was, quote, kept under various kinds of mental torture, verbally abused while sedated with sleep medication, and threatened to be transferred to a regular insane asylum, end quote. With a footnote at the bottom, so it goes into various parts of the movie, Carmine, uh, various religious themes. But I thought the Club of Baby Seal scene was one of the more interesting parts. Now, the whole reason I had these tabs open is because I was trying to recount the story of Bill Sidus to someone um, who was an autonomy student. And in 2012, there was a video on YouTube. And that video was posted in the Tragedy and Hope community. And every time I've had to refer somebody to that, I would just point them toward that link. Here's the post. We've been talking about this for a long time. This is an interesting story. I went to look it up last week, and of course that YouTube video is gone. So then I had to look up the articles, and since I had to look up the articles, I actually did a lot more time reading and learned a lot more than I had from just watching the video on the Club of Baby Seal. So here's the article aspect that inspired the video that was made years ago on YouTube that got censored that now I've taken the trouble to bring back to you. <laughs> the infamous Club a Baby Seal scene from Goodwill Hunting, 1998. The part of Sidus resigning after finding out that his programming work was to be used to destroy submarines discussed previously, was played out brilliantly during Hunting's interview with the National Security Agency, where, after being asked the question, the question isn't why should you work for the NSA, the question is why shouldn't you? Hunting, the character in the film, responds with, quote, Why shouldn't I work for the NSA? That's a tough one, but I'll take a shot. Say I'm working at the NSA and somebody puts a code on my desk something no one else can break. Maybe I take a shot at it. Maybe I break it. I'm real happy with myself because I did my job well. 
But maybe that code was the location of some rebel base in North Africa or the Middle East. Once they have that location, they bomb the village where the rebels are hiding. 1,500 people that I never met, never had no problems with, get killed. Now the politicians are saying, send in the Marines to secure the area. Because they don't give a fuck. It won't be their kid over there getting shot just like it wasn't them when their number got called up because they were off doing a tour in the National Guard. It'll be some kid from Southie over there taking shrapnel on the ass. He comes back to find that the plant he used to work for got exported to the country he just got back from. And the guy who put the shrapnel on his ass got his old job because he'll work for 15 cents a day and no bathroom breaks. Meanwhile, he realizes the only reason he was over there in the first place was so we could install a government that would sell us oil at a good price. Of course, the oil companies use a skirmish over there to scare up domestic oil prices. A cute little ancillary benefit for them, but it ain't helping my buddy at $2.50 a gallon. They're taking their sweet time bringing the oil back, of course. Maybe even they took the liberty to hire an alcoholic skipper who likes to drink martinis and fucking play slalom with the icebergs. It ain't too long till he hits one, spills the oil, and kills all the sea life in the North Atlantic. So now my buddy's out of work, he can't afford to drive, so he's walking to the fucking job interviews, which sucks because the shrapnel on his ass is giving him chronic hemorrhoids. Meanwhile, he's starving because every time he tries to get a bite to eat, the only blue plate special they're serving is North Atlantic Scrod with Quaker steak. So what I think? I think I'm holding out for something better. I figure, fuck it. While I'm at it, why not just shoot my buddy, take his job, give it to his sworn enemy, hike up gas prices, bomb a village, club a baby seal, hit the hash pipe, and join the National Guard. I could be elected president. FBI. In real life, the FBI had tracked and monitored Sidus, believing him to be a dangerous radical. Originally, the World War during originally during World War One, Sidus was classified as 1A for a time, but eventually reclassified as 4F. Those are states of being draft worthy or not being draft worthy, I believe. In 1940, one of the Bureau's agents wrote two letters to Bureau Chief J. Edgar Hoover describing Sidus as the, quote, leader of the Boston Metropolitan Transfer Group, a group mistaken for communist activities, and went on track, uh, went on to track various aliases of Sidus such as Parker Green, wherein supposedly in The New Yorker, he is described as a promising red for his earlier anti-draft, anti-war protesting activities. In the film version, Damon and Affleck, uh, in the original version of the script, were going to make hunting become a G-man. Specifically, Affleck and Damon originally wrote the screenplay as a thriller, a young man in a rough and tumble streets of South Boston who possesses superior intelligence is targeted by the FBI to become a G-man. Castle Rock Entertainment president Rob Reiner later urged them to drop the thriller aspect of the story and to focus on the relationship between Will Hunting and his psychologist, Robin Williams. At Reiner's request, the noted screenwriter William Goldman read the script and further suggested that the film's climax ought to be Will's decision to follow his girlfriend Skyler to California. All points which mimic William Sidus's actual life. So he comes back to find his job is gone, and it comes down to him making the conclusion that instead of working for you and doing all these things and all these people get killed, why don't I just go to the end result? He downstreamed them in their logic. So he's like, why don't I just go club a baby seal to death and have a nice day? That's where Sidus' story and hunting story overlap. Bill Sidus, William Sidus, who entered, he passed, he got 100% on the MIT entrance exam at age eight thinking he's going to go do good things with his brain. He's real smart. What's the purpose of being real smart? Make the world a better place. Imagine a young child, 8, 9, 10, 11, learning that his intellect is being used to kill people. That MIT does work for the people that make war so that they can kill people more effectively. So his punchline, so what do I think? I'm holding out for something better. I figure, fuck it, while I'm at it, why not just shoot my buddy, take his job, give it to a sworn en ele uh, enemy, hike up gas prices, bomb a village, club a baby seal, hit the hash pipe, and join the National Guard. I could be elected president. That is not an original scene 
that they were drinking some 12 packs or six packs as they claim and like coming up with a script. Whoever wrote that movie, brilliant piece of work, hints at a real lot of interesting history. The fact that William Sidus went through a process, right? William Sidus went through some forced uh, mental acceleration. What other Harvard student did that? Did they do that to through MK Ultra? Ted Kaczynski, who's mentioned in Goodwill Hunting. So I don't know. Seems like maybe that movie had some higher level players than just the two young guys who were like having trouble finding their way through life. <laughs> the story that you get from reading the tabloids or the story you get from actually digging into what do the articles say? Who are the people? What are they up to? And what, you know, what's the, how's the story unfold in reality? To me, this is all much more interesting than the movie Goodwill Hunting, but without that movie, without that art, right? The art is the lie that reflects back so you can see the truth. The, the film is not the truth, but the film, if you study it, reflects back into reality, and you can learn a lot about truth. So this article goes on. It's quite lengthy. It's got lots of pictures. goes into his photographic memory, uh, other trivia, other claims, and the references. So I had clicked into the references. Most of the references are open as other tabs here. So now that we've got just William Sidus and Boris Sidus, like I said, it sounds like two ailments. Let's look at Maxwell's Demon because this plays into Sidus's work and it might even play into uh, William James's work. I'm not sure. In Scientific Demons, Maxwell Demon is a hypothetical creature or, quote, very observant and neat fingered being, end quote, conceived in 1867 in an 1867 thought experiment by Scottish physicist James Clerk Maxwell. That is able to open a frictionless trap door between the two chambers of gas particles at different temperatures in such a manner that it could intelligently sort the particles by speed, thus moving heat without the expenditure of work from a cold body to a hot body, in contradiction to the second law of thermodynamics. So when Sidus is talking about uh, the contradiction of the laws of thermo thermodynamics. He's basing that work on James Clerk Maxwell, who also uh, did a lot of work in that area. So it's not just Sidus's original idea, because that comes out later in the animate and the inanimate, because that's one of the claims that uh, the second law of thermodynamics, while uh, accurate here on Earth, does not always apply the same way in other parts of the universe. And then in some places in the universe, it's actually in reverse. It works in the reverse, which is a pretty far out idea, especially for way back then. But then you're getting to touch on the topics that made somebody uh, appear to be so smart back then, because those are the ideas they're dealing with and grappling with. So that was a conundrum. Uh, and that's how James Clerk Maxwell undid that conundrum in a thought experiment, leading eventually to goodwill hunting. So I put this in the model. Let's go to the movie here. Let's just make sure we understand that it is a 1997 American drama film by Gus Van Zandt, starring Robin Williams, Matt Damon, Ben Affleck, Minnie Driver, and Stellan Skarsgård. Written by Ben Affleck and Damon, the film follows 20-year-old South Boston janitor Will Hunting, uh, deferred prosecution. The film grossed $225 million during its theatrical run from a $10 million budget. It was nominated for nine Academy Awards, including one for Best Picture. It won two, Best Supporting Actor and Best Original Screenplay for Act, uh, Affleck and Damon. Plot. We've kind of already covered the plot because we know about the real life uh, characters and how the NSA scene. So it's not really him. It's not Sidus telling the NSA back then. It was Sidus telling MIT. Right. So that's that's a small change, but it's a, still a direct parallel. Uh, we could go in and learn what they're going to tell us on Wikipedia for Goodwill Hunting anytime we want. What I'd like to do is just read a little bit about Matt Damon. And let's see, did we, we put him in here already? Let me call him up here. Matt Damon. No, I'm not thinking about Trey Parker when I say that. All right, Matt Damon. Um, he's an actor. Do we have actors in the history blueprint? Hmm. Hmm. 
Why don't I have actors in the history blueprint? Haven't been a big deal. We're going to put actor in there. They don't even have actor. Actor is such a common thing. Wikipedia doesn't even have it underlined right there. We're going to have to look up actor in a second. Um, I'm not so much interested. No, sorry. Didn't mean to highlight Cambridge. What I wanted to do is just get to early, early life and education to see where this young screenwriter who won the Academy Award after dropping out of Harvard, like, where did he come from? Damon was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts, the second son of stockbroker Kent Telford Damon and Nancy Carlson Page, an early childhood education professor at Leslie University. So his mom's a professor, his dad's a stockbroker. His father had English and Scottish ancestry, and his mother uh, is of five-eighths Finnish and three-eighths Swedish descent. Wow, somebody's had their DNA tested. Dan, uh, Damon and his family moved to Newton for two years. Uh, let's see. His parents got divorced when he was two, and they returned to, their, uh, to Cambridge with their mother. So um, grew up around Boston, divorced parents, but his parents were upper, upper middle class. Uh, he attended the Cambridge Alternative School and then the Cambridge Ridge, uh, Ringe in Latin School. So he's well-educated, kind of private school. And let's see. Uh, he credited his drama teacher Jerry Specka as most in important artistic influence through Ben Affleck, his good friend and schoolmate. Got the biggest roles, uh, though Ben Affleck got the biggest roles in longest speeches. So Damon uh, attended Harvard University, where he was a resident of Lowell House and a member of the class in 1992. He started acting in uh, the same year for Geronimo, an American legend. All right, so that's a little bit about where Damon comes from. Not going to put any of that in there other than he went to Harvard and he's an actor. That's good enough for right now. Didn't have, uh, I mean, you see who can become actors, right? Who can become Oscar award-winning screenwriters? Was any of that necessary for them to do that? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe it starts in earlier generations. Maybe they bring it to the table all at once. Benjamin Geza Affleck Bolt was born August 15th, 1972 in Berkeley, California. His family moved to Massachusetts when he was three. Uh, and his brother, Casey, was born there. They lived in Cambridge. So that's how they know each other. They're both from around Boston, specifically around Cambridge. Uh, so then uh, there's this conflict, because I read Casey's already, and I think we'll go to Casey's early life because they're brothers and they grew up together. This talks all about his dad's problems with alcoholism. It kind of gets all over the place, eventually becoming homeless. There's like a lot more to that. So let's just go to Casey's early life because he's in the movie. Caleb Casey McGuire Affleck Bolt was born in 1975. And the surname Affleck is of Scottish origin. They also talk about the various ancestry. Uh... Casey's mother was a Radcliffe College and Harvard-educated elementary school teacher. His father worked sporadically as an auto mechanic, a carpenter, a bookie, an electrician, a bartender, and a janitor at Harvard University, which I thought was interesting because I think something like that is in the plot. In the uh, mid-1960s, he had been a stage manager, director, writer, and actor for the Theater Company of Boston. During Affleck's childhood, his father was a disaster of a drinker. Affleck uh, first started acting by reenacting what was happening at home during role play exercises at Alateen meetings. That's how you become an actor. Casey Affleck is a, he's a really good actor. Role play. Role play what you see in real life. Get better at it than the people actually doing it. If you got time to do that, that's a thing to do. It's called acting. Let's just find. Harvey Weinstein, uh, on Ben Affleck's page, Me Too allegations. During the Me Too movement in 2017, Affleck was accused by two women of inappropriate behavior. Uh, in response to the Harvey Weinstein scandal, Affleck said that he would donate any future profits from his early Miramax films to charity supporting the victims of sexual assault. So Harvey Weinstein, if there was a connection between this history connected and last history connected, which was Anglophiles, Technophiles, and Jeffrey Epstein, there are connections between people closely associated with goodwill hunting and uh, that former history connected. All right, so now we got the characters who brought you the story, through which is about the real guy and his dad. 
I don't think there's an entry for Sidus's wife in here, although she, I thought, was involved in the, uh, well, we'll get to it with the reserve theory. Now let's go over here to William James. Because this is where we get into the thermodynamics nerdy discussion that maybe some of you have been waiting for. William James, 19, I'm sorry, 1842 to 1910, says IQ of 170. That's what he says. Hmm. Second law. James rejected the second law of thermodynamics. Specifically, according to James, uh, quote, quote, the second law is wholly irrelevant to history, save that it sets a terminus, for history is the course of things before the terminus, end quote. James had commented in uh, this in objection to his friend, American historian Henry, Henry Adams, who was writing a theory suggesting that the second law undermined all of human history. On the contrary, James reasoned, that between the beginning and at the end, human activity, rather than levels of physical energy, is the most important real we know of. So then it goes down into uh, various people that he worked with. Let's scroll down to reserve energy, and then we'll read the main article. In 1906, in what seems to be a follow-up to the issues he had with Spencer's soci uh, social forces theory, Namely, that the energy of food eaten does, uh, does not correlate with the energy or force associated with, quote, a leader, a discovery, a book, a new idea, or a national insult, end quote. James gave his speech turned article, uh, the title of, The Energies of Men, wherein he claims to have discovered a hidden mental energy principle, i.e., reserve energy concurrently with his protege, Russian-born American psychologist, Boris Sidus. So Goodwill Hunting's dad is hanging out with William James, and they come up with this idea. I don't know that energy is the right word, because when you get into energy, you get into thermodynamics, and there's no thermodynamics necessary. Like, when you make a leadership decision, a discovery, a book, a new idea, or a national insult, all the examples he gives, there's no heat transfer. It's, uh, it's like neurons firing. It's th they're already firing. I don't know. Um, so it might be an energy definition problem that's going to come up because there's going to be apparent contradictions because I've already had uh, uh, comments from emerald type personalities who are like, hey, you can't violate second law of thermodynamics. That's what makes it a law. But in fact, it's really a theory. So and Sidus was saying that the theory is valid here on Earth, but in far off places, he predicted black holes before they were publicly acknowledged. So possibly in those areas, yeah, physics turns upside down, I'm sure. James's idea and Boris Sidus's idea, not so sure, because, you know, they're political actors to some extent. They're toying with ideas and they're they have uh Let's say, in the case of William James, it seemed to have ideas, and then they go to try to prove them out instead of looking at the evidence and trying to figure it out. One, one of those methods I just described is science. It was the second one. And then the first one is often, that's eh, like scientism. It's like the appearance of science, but it's not really science. All right, so William James, he's not some fly-by-night psychotherapist. He's a very well-known in history, uh, Harvard psychologist he's the establishment the people in the status quo think what they think because of guys like William James and Boris Sidus all right reserve energy it's the next article we got to get into and let me catch us up in the brain to reserve energy theory because this is going to tie in to a few more things in psychology I'm sorry I thought it should read, because we're talking about energy, I thought it was going to be in physics. In psychology, reserve energy is a theory which supposes that in people there are reservoirs of surplus energy, both mental and physical in variety, that when successfully tapped, present resistances 
to fig teague that doesn't it doesn't the sentence doesn't end i think maybe the, are these getting translated is that how i'm saying <laughs> that when successfully tapped present resistances to fatigue end so uh your resistances to fatigue elevate you are able to elongate fatigue that's what they're trying to say overview in the 1890s american psychologist william james while theorizing about energy and mental ability was hiking in the adirondack mountains and during this time was told by one of the guides about how hikers in many cases may feel cold when they start to hike but as they progress into warm up in the climb getting second wind or even a third or fourth wind the gist of which he states in his own words so people get tired but then they're not tired and they can keep going that's what william james he needs to get out more first off because it's only because he doesn't get out on a hike that he's even noticing these things everyone here's the quote everyone knows what it is to start a piece of work either intellectual or muscular the feeling a feeling state or cold as an adirondack guide once put it to me and everyone knows what it is to warm up to the job the process of warming up gets particularly striking in the phenomena known as the second wind on unusual unusual occasion on usual occasion we make a practice of stopping an occupation as soon as we meet the first effective layer or so to call it of fatigue we have walked we have then walked played or worked enough we desist that amount of fatigue is an efficacious obstruction on this side of which are usually life is cast so because you don't go and make those breakthroughs and push through it like david goggins i wondered when i learned about this last week does david goggins know about reserve theory because he's like he's like making these breakthroughs just like what are being described and if he knew there was a formal methodology for that he might be able to make those breakthroughs faster or we might be able to make breakthroughs faster I think the only downside to how it was implemented with William Sidus is that there was no volition, there was no free will. It was something done as as he described it as torture, right? That's not a freedom type of situation. So we can learn about these concepts, but we also have to balance it out with like what is the ethical use of these concepts and where does freedom begin and end for you and others, right? So, uh let's see. <clears throat> I ended that quote. Continued the quote. Continuing, but if an unusual necessity forces us to press upward, onward, a surprising thing occurs. The fatigue gets worse up to a certain critical point when, gradually, it passes away, and we are fresher than before. We have evidently tapped a new level of energy, masked until then by the fatigue obstacle, which is usually obeyed there may be layer after layer of this experience a third and fourth wind may supervene mental activity shows the phenomenon as well as physical and in exceptional cases we may find beyond the very extremity of fatigue distress amounts of ease and power that we never dreamed ourselves to own sources of strength habitually not taxed at all because habitually we never push things through the obstruction never pass those early critical points end quote so that's what i talk about in the course prior round lecture six about the learning curve if you can push back if you can push past that critical point where you start to make the skills pay off and it's no longer just internalization and overwhelm and fire hose with information when you start to put them into practice that's when that critical transition takes place you start to see results then it all becomes a lot more fun that's actually being described so something that we can all observe now we can give a name to it i don't know about james and the second uh, law of thermodynamics and all that sort of stuff but let's not equate your mental capacity to overcome obstacles to the same thing that we run lights and computers with 
it's a type of energy, but it's not the same thing, right? So they're going to have different equations, right? These are, this is psychological energy. It is subjective energy. It is not objective, let's measure it and uh, weigh it and these sort of things, type of energy structures. This is almost cutting edge of thinking because people can't think their way past these barriers yet. They took this long just to get in front of me so I could put it in front of you. I think we should have all known stuff like this a long time ago. Just that it exists. If, you know, next time you're feeling sorry for yourself, think about what people are able to do that have been here before us, that worked much harder, that got much further. Put your life in perspective. Then it's easier to do the things you need to do to get done every day. Sometimes there, sometime thereafter, James began to discuss... William James began to discuss and or teach his new reserve energy theory of mental ability to his student, Boris Sidus, who had recently emigrated to the United States in 1887 to escape political persecution. In 1898, Boris's son, William Sidus, was born and with him began to test out, in theory, James's reserve energy theory on the new child the result of which became the most famous of all forced prodigy experiments. The, the younger Sidus, so this is William, Goodwill Hunting, in 1920, so after he protests against World War I, he splits and goes to California. Uh, so he published his book. It was 1925, but I think he wrote it in 1920, so that's why it says 1920. The Animate in the Inanimate, arguing that the existence of reserve energy in life forms represents a reversal of the second law of thermodynamics. Now, again, that seems like a big summary of a book. Can you summarize a one book into that? And even if so, William James, his namesake, and James Clerk Maxwell, uh, one of the uh, other Scots that did work in this area, a lot of Scottish physicists back in the electricity days of the early 1800s doing this type of work, trying to figure out how things work. Um, so there's a lot of other people before William Sidus who had that idea. So if he took that idea and built something upon it, uh, that still is there for examination. You need not throw out the baby with the bathwater just because you think that the second law of thermodynamics cannot be violated in any way, shape, or form. It could be violated by uh, an ambiguous definition. And therefore, it would not be a real violation, not a real contradiction. It would appear to be a contradiction because of the ambiguity of the grammar. So he publishes his book in 1925. In 1907, William James, so his predecessor, his namesake, uh, wrote a book called The Energies of Men. He stated an outline for his reserve energy theory. James supposedly claimed to have discovered this hidden energy theory principle concurrently with his concurrently with Russian born uh, Boris Sidus. So it's one of those situations where Boris Sidus shares the creative, uh, they named the theory, and then Boris also had the capability to run those experiments on his son and also had a place to incarcerate his son uh, for, you know, not a jail. You, the, you know, it's not an adult insane asylum, but it's like an insane asylum for pre-adults, which uh, Sidus, you know, uh, well, it says, Boris Sidus, in the experimental uh, accelerated education of his now famous son, child protege William Sidus, who by his father's accelerated home education and teachings was qualified to enter Harvard at age nine. We went through this sort of thing. Uh, let's go down. In the 1910s, this re reserve energy principle was beginning to be termed the law of reserve energy. This law was argued to re represent a capacity for withstanding pains, aches, and conquering disinclinations that would otherwise seem impossible. Let's see if I... The summarizing statement of the law of reserve energy is organisms have stored reserves of energy that are ordinarily not called upon, but that can be called upon and be ready for use for anyone who probes so deep. That was the part where I really thought it overlapped with the, the interviews and sessions of uh, David Goggins explaining his process of making breakthroughs in the physical reality because those uh, those concepts of having a, a second or third wind and pushing through 
it's obvious that most people have just formed that learned helplessness, those shells, and you can break through these shells and that those barriers that you're, you know, finding as the limit, they're all self-imposed and they're usually self-imposed through psychological ideas that people pick up during their lifetime or and or are indoctrinated into people through 15,000 hours of, of uh, Prussian schooling, Prussian education system. So, all right, at this point, we've got reserve energy theory, Maxwell's demon. We also have the 10% myth. This was one other part. I'm not sure if I added it to the original article. Let's go make, make sure. 10% myth, it should be on the side. Let's put it on the side. Let's put reserve energy on the side. And now, if I ever need to come back and reference, here's the article. Here's what this article talks about. And I already have an understanding of all the concepts in the article to be able to move off and read more on the same topic, different topic. I can close all these tabs when I'm done. I can forget about it because it's in the brain and it's in my brain. I've already learned about it and built the synapses to have the recall later. Speaking of recall later, let's get down to... See if I can scroll this over just a little bit. That's good enough. You guys can see the whole screen. 10% myth. In culture, the 10% myth is the postulate that the average person typically uses only 10% of their brain, while the remaining 90% remains dormant. The myth originated in the 1890s. Reserve men, uh, mental energy theories of Harvard psychologist William James and Boris Sidus, who applied the theory of the development of child prodigy William Sidus to affect an adult IQ of 250 to 300. That's what they're saying William Sidus's IQ was as an adult. Did you know they had IQs over 200? The figure of 10% came about as the James Sidus theory. It was retold over and over from small part, William James, 1906, to one quarter, Addington and Bruce, 1914, to 10%, World Almanac, 1929, attributed to scientists and psychologists, to 10%, 1936, attributed to William James. The Lowell Thomas figure was included in the 1936 bio uh, biographical preface section about Dale Carnegie in the 15 million copy bestseller, How to Win Friends and Influence People, which thus acted to solidify the semi-factual myth, semi-factual being that the so-called myth is based on actual scientific theory that was tested out in an actual case and proved correct to a significant extent. Origin. Let me just scroll this down so you can read it. The seed of the 10% myth originated... I'm sorry, they're going to repeat this whole paragraph again. In 1891, William James founded America's first psychology department at Harvard University, comprised of an 11-room psychology laboratory. During this period, a newly immigrated Russian by the name of Boris Sidus was completing his B.A. in 1890 and M.A. in 1891 at Harvard and began studying under James's tutelage, eventually receiving his Ph.D. That comes from the Prussian education system in 1896 and later his M.D. there. During this period, in about 1892, Boris and his wife Sarah Sidus uh, a Harvard physician herself began hosting a weekly philosophy psychology discussion group every Sunday at their house attended by scores of students, revered teachers, and no other than Professor William James, considered the most renowned of them all, who was said to have, quote, frequently climbed the many stairs to their attic, end quote. It was some time in this period that the reserve energy psychology theory originated. The first published statement of this theory, better known as the 10% myth, it seems, was in James's 1906 speech, The Energies of Men, wherein he commented that, quote, 
we make use of only a small part of our mental and physical resources, end quote. In the 1914 article, New Theories of Education, American journalist Addington Bruce called the James Sidus principle the law of reserve energy and was explaining it to the effect that in the days of the savage people only used three quarters of their brains, but that modern people were tapping into their mind with more, more use, having discovered their reserve mental energy. Here's the quote. Psychologists are more and more inclined to the opinion, first voiced only a short time ago by William James and Boris Sidus, that there is in every human being a store of disposable reserve energy, commonly utilized at infrequent interview, commonly utilized at infrequent intervals, but capable of being both utilized habitually to great advantage. Reaction to stimulus results in tapping a new level of energy without being in the slightest degree conscious of it. They have adjusted themselves to leading the leading of a fuller, more intense, more inf more effective life than they led in the days when, like the savage, they lived with three quarters of their brain unused End quote. In 1929, on the heels of James, uh, William James's view that we are, quote, we are making use of only a small part of our mental and physical resources, end quote, the World Almanac ran an advertisement from a self-improvement company that stated, quote, scientists and psychologists tell us we only use about 10% of our brain power, end quote. The myth became legend when a 1936 American writer Lowell Thomas commented in the conclusion of his introductory biography, quote, a short distinction, end quote, on Dale Carnegie, found in the introduction of the multi-decade long bestseller, How to Win Friends and Influence People, that, quote, Professor James of Harvard University used to say that the average person develops only 10% of his latent mental capacity. End quote. The over millions of people, at least 15 million, who have read his, uh, this book over the past century have gone on to popularize this 10% function factoid to the point where it is now part of the common cultural zeitgeist. Then it gets down to William Sidus. And now you know that Sidus' mom, Sarah, uh, she was a physician also at Harvard. So he's got two Harvard parents. They're into psychological theory. They're running themselves a place where they can lock some people up against their will. I don't know. I mean, I know that William Sidus, the son, he did not like it. You can read what he had to say about it. I'm going to uh, get to some of that right here. William Sidus. In, 19, in 1898, Boris and Sarah bore a sign, William James Sidus named in honor of William James, in which Sarah, particularly Boris, began to test and prove the mental reserve energy theory. Their test, in fact, was so successful in the developing of their son's intellectual abilities using this principle that William was on the first page of the New York Times 19 times we went through that. Uh, let's go down to the part where he continues, quote, You must begin a child's education as soon as he displays any power to think. Everybody knows how hard it is to learn a new language late in life. The same holds good of all of our acquisitions. The earlier they are acquired, the more truly they become part of us. At the same time, keep us alive within the child. At the same time, keep alive within the child the quickening power of curiosity. Do not repress him. Answer his questions. Give him the information he craves. Seeing to it always that he understands your explanations. You need not be afraid of overstraining his mind. On the contrary, you'll be developing it as it should be developed. Will he be, uh, will he habituating the child to avail himself of the great fund of latent energy, which to most of us, to our detriment, so seldom use? The law of reserve mental energy as set forth by Professor William James, has much to do with the progress of my son. Professor James explained that getting, uh, Professor James explained the power of getting what is popularly known as second wind might be controlled at will 
and enable us to accomplish daily and regularly what we can do under stress circum uh, what we can only do under stress of circumstances if you do prolong mental work you will find yourself growing tired but if you keep on working the feeling of fatigue will pass away you are drawing on your reserve mental energy end quote in 1910 American journalist Addington Bruce began to popularize a combination of the reserve energy theory its application in William Sidus's childhood abilities in conjunction with the logic that a large fraction of the average brain is unused so he's taking those three pieces and putting them together. It is primarily through the writings of Bruce that the figure of the unused percent began to be associated with child prodigy William Sidus. In 1951 retrospect, Sarah commented back on their application of the reserve, uh, reserve mind theory on their son. Quote, Genius was the term used for Billy. My son had merely learned the ability to use his brain to its capacity. In this regard, the science of psychopathology has set forth this fundamental principle, which is not only of the utmost importance in medicine, but also in the field of education. It is the idea of stored up, dormant, potential, subconscious power, reserve energy Billy was able to achieve an understanding easier than most people because he was aware of how to release and harness this energy so you can read on more you can uh, scroll down you can check into all the links but a lot of these links again we've already opened so now when we're reading an article we are more and more familiar with the contents of each one because we're getting cross referenceability between William James, William Sidus, Boris Sidus, uh, Sarah Sidus, Goodwill Hunting, these ideas that are coming into confluence that we're only able to talk about because two guys wrote a screenplay once upon a time and it became famous enough that we have it as a common reference and we can have these types of interactions uh, purveying information and maybe you do some clicking on your end afterwards, do some learning on your own. This is uh, the last couple pieces here. The Animate and the Inanimate is the major publication of William Sidus because the rest of his writings uh, were unpublished. So it's not that he didn't write more, uh, but this is the thing that's published and it is probably the more substantial of his works given the light descriptions of the other parts, the science fiction and these sort of things. The animate and the inanimate. Let me make sure I have this in the model. Where is William Sidus? We can just put it here off the article because it's talked about. Animate. All right, so we got the book. We got the page. Let's click that. There's the chapter. There's the author. There's the place it's being referenced over here. We can click back, see it in the same thing different way right a couple different ways to see the information depending on what which aspect you're modeling out we're gonna read this article so we're gonna have that page open this is where it gets pretty interesting taking everything we've just learned putting it together the animate and the inanimate in famous publications the animate and the inanimate is a 131 page thermodynamic theory of life book written between 1916 and 1920 by American child prodigy William Sidus while he was locked in a sanitarium in which he attempts to outline the nature of animate and inanimate matter in the context of thermodynamics Maxwell's demon and what he calls the big collision theory of universal origins it's almost like a Big Bang Theory. Not saying it's right, just saying it sounds like a predecessor to that. This is the part where people who are into the study of eugenics and the history and the confluences of progressivism and eugenics, these sort of things coming together. Production. In 1916, at the age of 18, Sidus sent a letter 
to Julian Huxley, in which he stated, quote, How has everything been this summer with you? I myself have been writing that theory of mine regarding the second law of thermodynamics. In a short while, I expect I will be in Cambridge studying in the law school. The university opens September 25th. End quote. According to this statement, it would seem that he had previously discussed this theory, his theory, with Huxley, who himself was under the view that the second law is inoperable in the case of evolution. Possibly a year or more previous when he was aged 17 or younger. So William James Sidus is 17. He's hanging out with Julian Huxley, the brother of Aldous Huxley. Julian Huxley, uh, let's see, 20, 25 years after this, will become the director of uh, the, the British Eugenics Society. So he's into eugenics. He's also into um, some United Nations, UNESCO. He's also a director of UNESCO. So 25 years before that happens, you learn that William James Sidus and Julian Huxley are corresponding and that Huxley has, for reasons of eugenics and evolution, uh, something against the second law of thermodynamics because it doesn't hold true. It means that uh, uh, the theory, uh, origin of species, the preservation of the favored races is a subtitle. It uh, is in contradiction to the second law of thermodynamics as seen by Julian Huxley and evidenced uh, in these uh, these writings, this correspondence. Sidus' theory was finally published in the book The Animate and the Inanimate in 1920 and eventually formally published by the Gortham Press in 1925. So there's two publications of it, a first printing and then a formal printing. In this book, adding to the various theories of existence, Sidus set forth the view that life is a reversal of of the second law of thermodynamics. This was the only published book by Sidus when he was 22 in which he used his own name because he did write things uh, using a pseudonym. Overview of the book. Building on the reserve energy theories of American psychologist William James in which a person is theorized to have latent mental stores of energies such as second or third winds of thought along with English physicist William Thompson's views on life and the second law, and Scottish physicist James Maxwell's conception of an intelligent demon being able to circumnavigate the second law, Sidus used a theory of probability to argue that a vital force, a life force, exists in life in living mat matter able to supply available energy in a converse manner to entropy. Unavailable energy, such that, quote, animal life acts the part of Clerk Maxwell's sorting demon, end quote. Asylum. In the May Day riots of 1919, Sidus was among the 114 people arrested for protesting the war and for being a conscientious objector to the draft and was sentenced to 18 months of jail six months for rioting, and a year for assaulting an officer. Sidus appealed and was released on $500 bail under the condition that he be locked in a sanitarium operated by his two parents, both psychologists. In his own words, when looking back on the situation some 20 years later, he was, quote, kidnapped by his parents by arrangement with the district attorney and was taken to a sanitarium operated by them and kept there a full year from October 1919 to October 1920, ages 21 through 22. On the conditions of his rehabilitation, he comments, quote, I was kept under various kinds of mental torture, consisting of being scolded and nagged at. Everything that did or did not happen was grounds for a tongue lashing, protracted over many hours, for an average of six to eight hours a day. Sometimes this scolding was administered while I was loaded with sleeping medicine, or after being waked up out of a sound sleep. 
and the threat of being transferred to a regular insane asylum was held up in front of me constantly, with detailed descriptions of the tortures practiced there, as well as the simple legal process by which he could be committed to such a place." End quote. This last bit on legal processes was accurate, as both Sidus' parents were physicians, and, in mo and by law in most states, any two physicians can commit a man without giving him a chance to defend himself into a sanitarium or asylum where he can be held incommunicado indefinitely. In October 1920, he was taken to California to prevent his communication somehow with friends in his home city 60 miles away. Sidus states that he made his escape from there in September 1921. He stated that for years afterwards, his parents attempted to get him back to the old tortures, resorting from time to time in various efforts to track him down and persuade his friends to turn him over for protection. In any event, the preface to the animate and inanimate is July, or January 6th, 1920, which means that he wrote his masterpiece while in an asylum. In that masterpiece, interestingly, in his work, Sidus predicted the existence of black holes using the term black body stars, which he defined as a type of sun that would take in all light energy and therefore be totally invisible some 47 years before the term black hole was even invented. A 1967 coining of American astrophysicist John Wheeler. Sidus also described what is now known as the event horizon using the term boundary surface. A partial explanation of his theory is found in chapter 8, the nebular hypothesis, where Sidus explains his views on the nebular hypothesis, black bodies, and radiation thermodynamics. Our previous consideration on the production of radiant energy from the stars indicates that such production of radiant energy is only possible where the second law of thermodynamics is followed, that is, in a positive section of the universe. In a negative section of the universe, the reverse process must take place, namely, space is full of radiant energy, presumably produced in a positive section of space and the stars use this radiant energy to build up a higher level of heat. All radiant energy in that section of space would tend to be absorbed by the stars, which would thus constitute perfectly black bodies, and very little radiant energy would be produced in that section of space, but would mostly come from the boundary surface, the event horizon. What little radiant energy would be produced in a negative section of space would be pseudo-teleological, directed only towards stars which have enough energy to absorb it, and no radiant energy, or almost none, would actually leave the negative section of space. The peculiarity of the boundary surface between the positive and negative sections of space is, then, pr that practically all light that crosses it, crosses it in one direction namely from the positive side to the negative side. If we are on the positive side, as it seems to be the case, then we could not see beyond such surface, though we might easily have gravitational or other evidence of bodies existing beyond that surface." End quote. Sidus, according to biographer Amy Wallace, had actually formulated his ideas on entropy, black stars, and life as early as 1915, when he was 17, during his stay at the Rice Institute. Wallace states that it was not until the publication of the 1939 book, An Introduction of the Study of Stellar, cult, uh, stellar Structure, by Indian-born American astrophysicist, Subrahmanyan Chandrasekhar, that the existence of black holes was suggested. Stimulus to publish. This is how published, uh, uh, how Sidus got to publish his book. And then we'll get to Buckminster Fuller's review of the book, and then we're going to get back to the, the, the gist, bring it all together. Stimulus to publish. 
Sidus stated that he was the first, at first hesitant to publish his theory, but that he gained confidence on discovering the following quotation by Irish-born Scottish mathematical physicist William Thompson. Quote, It is conceivable that animal life might have the attribute of using heat of surrounding matter as it is natural temperature as a source of energy for mechanical effect. The influence of animal or vegetable life on matter is infinitely beyond the range of any scientific inquiry hitherto entered on. Its power of directing the motions of moving particles in the demonstrated daily miracle of our human free will and in the growth of generation after generation of plants from a single seed are infinitely different from any possible result of the fortuitous concurrence of atoms. End quote. Fuller, 1979 Review. This is talking about Richard Buckminster Fuller. Sidus's treatise supposedly failed to receive a single review for many decades. That's, I'm just going to break away from the text for a second. That's really interesting, right? Smartest kid ever. Front page of New York Times 19 times. He writes a book. Age 17, not even waiting until he's 50 or 60, age 17, writing a book. Nobody reads or reviews that? Hmm. That's interesting. When else has that happened? Sidus's treatise supposedly failed to receive a single review for many decades, supposedly being found only in a few dusty attics. The first review, it seems, was done by Sidus's former Harvard classmate, Buckminster Fuller. Who in the late 19, who in late 1979 was handed a fat envelope marked "A Present for Bucky" from American biographer Dan Mahoney. Mahoney is Columbia University graduate student who had read about Sidus in 1976 and had been puzzled as uh, to what Sidus had been doing all those years after leaving Harvard, as he was had been probing the lost years of Sidus's life and was attempting a biography on William and Boris Sidus. After reading Sidus's book, Fuller dispatched a letter to Scientific American editor Gerard Peel, urging him to reprint the text. Quote, Imagine my excitement and joy on being handed this Xerox of Sidus's 1925 book, in which he clearly predicts the black hole. In fact, I find his whole book to be a fine cosmological piece. Norbert Wiener used to talk to me about him, uh, and Norbert was grieved that Sidus did not go on to fulfill his seemingly great promise of brilliance. I hope you'll become as excited as I am at this discovery that Sidus did go on after college to do the most magnificent thinking and writing. I find him focusing on the, many of the same subjects that fascinate me and coming to about the same conclusions as those as I have published in Synergetics and will be publishing in Synergetics Volume 2. William suggested that the second law of thermodynamics is not a law at all but a probability. The fact that the second law seems to hold true is more or less coincidence in our corner of the universe. Also, Entropy is reversed in other corners of the universe. Elsewhere, chaos is proceeding to order. And if the second law appears to dominate local events, then probability suggests there must be reversals of it all around us that we haven't yet recognized. Sidus theorized that inanimate, dead objects follow the second law, while animate, Living objects, uh, living things, reverse the law and draw upon, quote, reserve fund, end quote, of energy to mold the universe to their will. Switching out my drinks. Got the hot tea in play now. <clears throat> so that's an interesting observation right there. 
law of thermodynamics applying to inorganic or dead things. Uh, this reserve energy theory applying to living things. Yet to be understood, yet to be known, which is right, but we have to learn our way forward. So this seems like a crazy idea, but we'll see how it turns out. Life provided the reversal entropy that Sidus's theory required. So his theory required the evidence that already existed. That's what that sentence says. William's theory, William's theory remains highly speculative. There is no reason to believe that a universe, uh, that a reverse universe exists. Also, biological processes are no longer the mystery that they were at the time of his writing. But while working on this problem, Sidus came up with other conclusions that are interesting to this day. Cosmogony is the study of the origins of the universe. The most popularly known theory today is called the Big Bang Theory. In the animate and the inanimate, William proposed a, quote, great collision, end quote, theory, wherein two large inert bodies containing all the matter in the universe between them collided. This collision provided the energy that started the universe in motion. As our sun hurtles through space to an eventual frozen death, it gives off energy. Somewhere in the universe, there are suns that take in energy, and death becomes life. The other kind of sun, Sidus dubbed a black body, since it would be taking in all light energy and therefore be totally invisible. This exactly describes a black hole. Should the second law of thermodynamics eventually re reverse itself in this black body, it would then start giving off energy and become a sun. In this way, the universe would be in a perpetual state of ebb and flow, all energy being conserved. Scientists all over the world are still working on a problem known as Fermi's paradox proposed by Enrico Fermi. If the universe is infinite, Fermi postulated, then everything possible must occur somewhere, sometime. Therefore, there must exist a planet where the inhabitants speak English. Why haven't we met them? Why haven't we met anyone out there? Young Sidus also said, quote, the theory of the reversibility of the universe supposes that life exists under all sorts of circumstances, even on such hot bodies as the sun, end quote. Like Fermi's paradox, Sidus's reversibility theory also requires that life must exist in every corner of the universe in order to provide the necessary reversals of the law of entropy. The theory is challenging fascinating and controversial on its own merits today. It was far more so in 1925, and it must be remembered that it sprang from the mind of a boy in his early 20s who devoted only a portion of his scholarship to this book because he was dedicated to such a vast variety of other intellectual pursuits at the same time. Had he dedicated his life entirely to cosmogony, who knows what extraordinary body of work he might have produced. End quote. That was the quote from Buckminster Fuller. That's his review of Sidus's book. Sidus was, in fact, 22 when he wrote the book. Value. In circa 2010, an inscribed copy of The Animate and the Inanimate was sold in London to an anonymous collector, for eight thousand US dollars. I looked online last week after I read this article to see if I could get a copy. Is there a first edition, a second edition, what's out there? Not a whole lot to be easily got. Can't find it anywhere. So if you find yourself a copy, uh, it's probably worth more in the future. But if you're just looking to read his book, I got it right here. So this comes from Sidus.net. This is from the researcher who wrote the book that sent it to Bucky and just read the review. He created the website. All these documents are on there, and they are free to the public. Uh, copyright 1925. This is the Gorham Press 
Boston, Mass. So he did a 1920 private printing, and this was a public printing. Um, it's not a huge book. It's 131 pages. It's too long for me to read in this episode, but I'm going to give you the link. And the link is in the History Blueprint. And we can go to this uh, last tab, which is Chapter 12. And I just wanted to drop this, uh, this one paragraph. Then you have an idea of why you might want to read the book, but it's not like the money shot from the book. Quote, We thus find that considerations of gravitational attraction lead us to suppose an infinite universe with stars approximately uniformly distributed throughout space. Similarly, with considerations of probability, which led us to the same conclusion. But on the contrary, the observed distribution of light in the sky leads us to the directly opposite conclusion, that our stellar universe is finite, though there are many stray stars outside that universe that occasionally come in, and though similarly some of those stars may occasionally stray out of the limits of the universe. There may be other such finite universes in which we may conceive of things in such a series of the following. Electrons are particles that make up atoms. Atoms are particles that make up molecules. Molecules are particles that make up masses. Masses are particles that make up planets. Planets are the particles that make up stellar solar systems. Stellar systems are the particles that make up universes. And universes are the particles that make up existence. Compare that to anything most of us wrote when we were 20. <laughs> it's, a, it's a step up. All right, so let me, uh, let me click this back. Let's just make sure. Let's check our work. So we got the article. We got the different parts that we have identified as being the general grammar to understand this single article. It talks about a movie, which was written by some characters. Uh, we talked about Affleck and Damon. And then we went into Maxwell's Demon and reserve energy and William James and William Sidus and I'm also going to connect into here MIT because there's more to be learned and from MIT you've got Norbert Wiener who was one of the people who was coming after uh, Sidus so Norbert Wiener hears about this really, really smart guy because Norbert Wiener is a really, really smart guy back at that time. Uh, he was working at MIT, and his uh, intelligence was also being used to create not only artificial intelligence, but all sorts of war-making fundamentalities, right? The trickle-down effect is you might have cruise control on your car because of Norbert Wiener, but in order to bring you cruise control, they had to make cruise missiles. You see the difference? between creativity helping you and creativity killing people then trickle down to help you <laughs> difference is tax dollars all right i'm going to go back to full screen let's do it like this do it live someday maybe that's going to change over let's see it'll take it a second and there we have it you got the end of another uh, History Connected. Let's do that again. And there you have it. You got the end of another History Connected episode. In this episode, we read an article published by Harvard, and then we broke down that article into the individual parts and the topics mentioned in that article. We broke those all open in tabs. We went through, read the articles for those tabs. We rearranged them in the History Blueprint in context of each other and attaching them to their original resources so that we do all this learning and we encapsulate it so we can call upon it later should we ever want to recount what we've learned to others and provide that wisdom out there. At this point, <clears throat> I'm going to need to take a sip of my hot tea. Who wants to uh, step up in this meeting and share observations, insights, things you didn't know, uh, comments, questions, complaints, whichever way you want to go? Hey, Richard, this is Michael. I'll, I'll jump in. How you doing, Michael? I'm doing well. Once again, I really appreciate uh, your uh, subject matter here today because I think it's uh, some really powerful stuff. Uh, you know, as you were going through this, one of the things I was thinking of is the Flow Genome Project, uh, better known from the book, The Rise of the Superman. Have you uh, 
check that stuff out? No, I'm not. I'm not there yet. But I was just talking to a student who called for enrollment the other day, and he has a molecular biology degree, postdoctoral work. He wants to have his own DNA lab. These sort of things, right? So my first was, do you know the history of the industry that you're getting into? Right. Before you want to operate a business in that industry, let's look at molecular biology and who came up with these ideas. So what I explained was uh, the reference book is called The Molecular Vision of Life, Caltech, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the New Biology by MIT professor Dr. Lily K. L-I-L-Y-K-A-Y. I believe she's passed away recently in the last 10 years. Excellent book. You find on Amazon. It's probably 60 bucks. It's hard to get. Uh, there's some good articles. I think it's actually Chris Kresher, the nutrition guy, did a really good, or maybe it's one of his colleagues. It was a health guy who did a really good book report on that because it's an expensive book to get. But basically, Rockefeller Foundation, the Anglophiles, the technophiles, technocracy people, they liked eugenics. They helped to fund Hitler. They got a bad name with eugenics through World War II. Coming out of World War II, they want to continue that work. They rebrand it as molecular biology. Then fast forward to today, to you've got genome projects, all these sort of things, trying to take control over nature in a way that's not very uh, educated or informed. It's like, we can barely use electricity. We still have to boil water to make electricity. It's like, let's figure out electricity and how life works and things like that before we go making life-ending technologies or technocracies or these sort of things. So there's a lot to it. So I didn't get to that specific use case of the Genome Project, but I have spent a lot of time figuring out where these ideas have developed from and the ideas and philosophies driving them underneath as opposed to evidence being the driver for these types of things. Yeah, well, that you know the uh, the reserve energy. It, it sounds very much like what they're describing as flow these days, and uh, you know the the Superman project and the and the uh, the flow genome project is essentially a, a, a project that's kind of back funded by DARPA, and it also kind of ties in with the Super Soldier project that. Uh, you know, the CIA, I don't know if it's the CIA or the, you know, the Pentagon, everybody else is, is you know, trying to develop a, a super soldier, you know, kind of transhumanism thing. But uh, this, this all kind of, it just, it sounds way too, way too close to each of these things. And then the other thing is uh, Walter Russell. Are you familiar with his work? He wrote a book right around the same time, 1926, called uh, The Universe One, and then went on to uh, a couple other books. One's called The Secret of Light, but it, essentially it's a cosmogony kind of description of his view of the world that's quite a bit different and might also tie in. I, I, you know, I don't know about the thermodynamics thing, but uh, it, it might might all fit together i don't know well there's also the theory that life is as complex or simple as you make it for yourself <laughs> as you want to see it some people go through life and things are very simple and some people can keep looking layer beyond layer beyond layer but here's what i've learned if you look far out into the universe or you look far down into the smallness of things they're kind of the same yeah. and they break outside of the rules and they don't make sense and i think there's a reason for that because all those things come together here in the present moment, and this is where we should focus our attention. And it's not meant to go look too far out or look too far down. Let's figure out the game of life, interactions with other human beings that are peaceful and volitional, figure out how to make super husbands and super dads and super other things other, other than super soldiers, because that's where DARPA and all their money, they don't know what else to do with it. They keep getting money thrown at them every year, more and more and more. What do we do? I don't know. Make the AI smarter. Build bigger computers. Make CERN bigger. Let's expand CERN. Like the, they don't know. They're just getting money thrown at them. They're not solving the, our problems that we have as individuals of how to survive and thrive in the world and keep ourselves safe from predators like those sociopaths <laughs> that uh, Will Sidus didn't want to work for. You yeah. know. Well, it's it's also interesting that you know like uh, th these government labs and research are always kind of you know. Uh, 
farming the talent and essentially getting rid of, uh, or you know, like taking on all the all the smartest students that they can to, you know, send them off to their research projects before they really even know what's, you know, what's up or down, you know. And it's interesting that Citus, uh, you know, essentially refused, and that's why this story kind of went a different direction than probably something else and similar to Kaczynski, you know, so very interesting, very interesting stuff. Richard, thank you so much. Thank you, Mike, for paying attention, chiming in. Not everyone's available at this odd time slot during the week, Wednesday at 4.30s, and usually I'm running late, so I always appreciate those of you from the course who show up live, and then I get a lot of comments and stuff through the replays within the within the curriculum and then when it goes to YouTube on Thursdays uh, that's always fun to to premiere it and chat back and forth with people as I add the links and I rewatch it back so I can add another layer layer of detail to the description so I try to make that useful and functional and uh, so far it's grooving because I don't have to do a lot of prep I'm just bringing work that I'm already doing and showcasing it in a way that other people can take advantage and maybe learn something and do likewise if they so choose Anyone else with observations, questions, comments, concerns from the viewing audience that's live right now on Wednesday? I thought maybe the extra 10 hey, seconds. Hey, hey, what's going on? What's up? Hey, Rich. Uh, I got it out a couple places because I'm in the middle of making dinner and carrying you around on my phone right now. Um, this, the whole, the whole thing can get into a whole bunch of uh, fuzzy areas of thought, you know, the, uh, the place where we have um, our difficulty with um, the difference between subjective and objective, you know, some of these same ideas um, I read in uh, Tertium Organum, you know, P.D. Ostensky, you know, and which was another thinker from around that kind of time, you know, all about, you know, four dimensional space and all that kind of thing. And um, in that, you know, the whole, the whole, whole thing about psychology, uh, you know, versus, um, you know, the what, how, what, what's the word? How, how am I trying to say this? You know, you're talking about um, the animate being, the inanimate being subject to the laws of third thermodynamics, where the inanimate wasn't. In other words, you know, the question we're all trying to answer what is life itself? Like that? You know. So that's my observation about it. Well, I think, first off, there is something to their observations. I just don't think they have it right yet, which means there's a lot more to be discovered. And until people know about that and that ability to make it discoverable, it's not going to be discovered because everyone thinks it's already figured out. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. As, so as a for instance... In physics, I remember learning physics, and it's like if if you, I hold if I give you a sixty pound log, and you're holding it, and you're not moving it, according to physics, you're not doing any work, Ty. <laughs> gotcha. So how do you, how do you feel about that? Do you feel like you're doing work if I ask you to hold that thing, and you're not moving it any distance, and you know, they got equations for that. So the equations apply to inanimate objects definitely but when you try them on yourself some of those physics equations don't work because you feel like you are definitely doing work but the disc the, the equation says no you're not moving anything <laughs> so right, not doing right. Work. Uh, maybe all the work I'm doing is mental but I don't have a uh, I don't have the metrics uh, to be able to measure what that is that I'm doing to figure out how I'm gonna lift the laws well you know, we don't have a way to measure it but yeah, right, because it's not objective reality. So if it was objective, we could measure it. But because it's subjective, that's where it brings in like the internal work of doing that yourself because there's no one else to compare it to anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, the fuzzy part of the thought about it is that, um, 
you know, um, it's, it's like uh, scientism or religion of any kind where it's, um, well, we can't prove that it's not true. So it's true. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it, that's kind of the, uh, that's kind of the problem with it. You know, yeah, we can't prove a negative. So first yes. off, don't Can't don't argue with people. Who, don't argue with people who don't know how to argue, because otherwise you're going to be arguing for a long time. Because where does the argument end? Right. I mean, yeah. I mean, because you know, we in in that sense, we could we could all be flatlanders here, right? And when a three dimensional object goes through through uh, space in flatland, you only see you know that you know the blind man and the elephant. You only see that much of it. You know. Well, but, what you're touching uh, on. You're touching on mm -hmm. smart people problems. So um, Flatland was written back in like the 1880s. Edward something or other. Edmund Ab Abbott, yeah. Yeah, Edward yeah, Abbott, yeah. Right. So I have his book, and then I have, uh, the, there's a sequel to it. I'm not sure if he wrote it or not. And then there's several uh, other books on that theme. The purpose of that line of thinking is to take your brain through dimensionality, right? Because we're in, we're in four dimensions now, three dimensions mm -hmm of physical space plus a dimension of time so those four dimensions make up our physical experience right right to be able to conceptualize above that that's a little brain power it's like writing 3d objects on a two piece you know 2d piece of paper right, but right. You can depth. It's, it's like seeing a, a cinematic movie and thinking that there's depth to the scene when there's not it's flat on a screen right so it's all play between light and shadow Exactly. Anyway, I just thought I'd throw uh, some of that in there for thought, <clears throat> just because that's what it is. I want to piggyback me. on some of the stuff you're saying, Ty. Yeah. Go ahead, Adam. Um, since since I, I only have a humbler bachelor's degree in physics, but uh, when I'm teaching it to high school students, we talk about physics like a foreign language. You know, that example you're talking about holding up a log with um, – Without moving it, Rich, there, there's work that, that we commonly think of, and there's the energy that we have a common understanding of, and then that means something different uh, in the discipline of physics. So um, there's, there's that element to consider, too. There's a bit more grammar when it comes to getting into, into science, that, that words that we think we know and, and we have a common understanding of have a, have a different meaning. So, for right. example, in physics, you know, we would talk about work as as pushing on something and moving it in that direction. Um, that's what work is. Um, and energy is the ability to, to push on something and move it in some direction. So I know if I was holding you know, a 50 pound log up, I would get tired. I would definitely be burning calories. Um, but at the same time, there's, there's a, if you wanna get mechanistic about it, there's a whole lot of little objects in the human body that we could be looking at and talking about the energy going from cell to cell or muscle to muscle or whatever. Um, and I don't want to throw the, the baby out with the bathwater when we, when we start to um, start to maybe put some of these, some of these ideas aside or, or start getting really uh, grandiose, well, I don't know, grandiose is not the word, but very broad interpretations of, um, of what some, some physicists or scientists say. Yeah, I think it's, um, I, I pointed toward an ambiguity in the definition because that's where the apparent contradictions usually end up showing up later. And then if you find one that shows up later, you got to go back to the ambiguity of the definitions and make it more refined. And it might be a first necessary refinement because the energy that they describe in physics is very different than the energy that is internal that is being used in a psychological subjective manner. And the fact that they have similar mouth sounds to describe those things, I think is the folly. And that's the point of ambiguity that could readily be cleared up by some individual who lives today. No one's done it yet. Can anybody straighten out these theories? And maybe there is something to what William James is observing, but it's not energy. It's something else that uh, is different than physics. You mean like the Easterns call it prana or mana or chi, something like that? Well, now that's an interesting question. Was William James hanging out with theosophists? Because if he was, they were talking about those ideas around that same time. Um, so I don't know the answer to that question. That's going to be uh, homework for this assignment. Theos Theosophy and Annie Besant and those characters, uh, Balfour, there's a whole bunch of 
the Fabian socialists and theosophists. There's a lot of overlap in those types of uh, religio philosophies of politics. Levat, I don't know. Alice Bailey. Now, I don't know if uh, he was hanging out with them, but um, but Ospensky and Church Morganum did uh, have long passages of quotes of William James. Um, so there was that going on too. So. Oh. Uh, the, re the reason why I brought that up is because I think, you know, it's interesting because now we're getting into the realm of the Eastern traditions where this was, this, what we're talking about was actually the focus, that intangible energy that comes from within. And that, you know, a lot of those people could produce lots of energy without eating hardly anything. So it's, it even makes the argument that it's, you know, energy in, energy out kind of funny so anyway just thought that was interesting right the, the monk who uh sits and meditates naked in a snowbank and melts the snow around him that kind of thing yeah i mean they're capable of all kinds of things and then you talk to them and find out that they don't really eat very often so where are they getting all this energy that's above my pay grade i don't know i haven't done any time in the himalayas or nepal at one of those monasteries I ain't got much either. <laughs> but reserve energy being equated to prana or saying there's this description in Western society of reserve energy and therefore the theory of how to tap into it. Is there any other evidence artifact in history uh, from any culture that has something similar to what William James and these characters were calling reserve energy theory? Because I think there's something to it. I think that David Goggins, like what he's talking about is a direct correlation of him discovering this on his own. He didn't read William James's book and then go out and become a Navy SEAL and tap into that stuff. He figured it out the hard way. William Sidus, from the get-go, was being indoctrinated involuntarily through that system, right? Uh, and later incarcerated which I just found to be a tragic turn. I thought maybe he was really adopted and that Boris and Sarah weren't his real parents or something and they could treat their adopted child like that, but I'm pretty sure they're, it's their biological child that they did that to. I don't know. So I don't like to judge people who aren't here anymore because there's not a lot of benefit in it for anybody. <laughs> but I found that to be kind of like disturbing. So any other uh, uh, quotes there, Cameron, that you wanted to draw upon? Uh, no, uh, I just was inspired to think about things that I haven't thought about in a long time. And it's just, it's just funny that, that, you know, the second wind, the energy that you have during your second wind is actually, you know, in some ways stronger than it was in your first wind. So it's, I don't know, it's kind of like paradoxical. It, it might be just a mental thing. Like you don't think you can keep going so you stop for two minutes and then you can jump back on your bike and all of a sudden you can go you know four times farther than you did before you quit the first first time that's that's happened to me on several occasions I'm like why why is it that after I totally exhaust myself in two miles that all of a sudden if I you know I think I can't go further but you know then I'm like well I'm already on the trail I've either got to go back down that mountain and risk killing myself or I can just keep going and then you go four times farther than you did to begin with and it's like it's nothing after that so there it's the second wind is actually really strong it's not some you know minor thing but right it's not a it's not a peripheral thing it's something that comes into strong focus but only after you do it and keep going so the way I've described it in the past before I knew any of the history about reserve energy because the most I knew was Goodwill hunting was based on a true story of a guy, and that's where they got the club of Navy, uh, cl uh, club of Baby Seal scene, right? So that, that was my superficial knowledge. And I would have kept calling upon that and calling upon that until one day it's censored off YouTube, and I actually have to go do the research myself, read the articles, and then I was like, oh, this is probably worth sharing with other people before I close all these tabs and forget about it. Let's do something with it. So that ability to, um, the way I'd phrased it was, like, yeah, you, you're tired. You're at your limit. You need to stop. You need to quit, especially in a business project. This happens all the time. 
you're too you're too tired you're, you're questioning why you're even doing it you feel like quitting and i say do it quit and then just keep going like if i had a problem solving like a, a computer problem i don't know what's going on there's some driver it's not working i just basically get to a point where i can't solve it there's no more options i'm going to quit so i quit and then 30 seconds later i'm like oh but i could try this and then i keep going that's it and if you learn how to do that in any capacity of your life it can carry over to these other areas of life and i'm not saying that's reserve energy theory or anything like that i'm just saying that's a good way to get around your own limitations and get to the next step yeah no it's a good metaphor and it's applicable to everything you're doing here so no i'm glad you did this and i'm actually gonna have to go back later and watch this again because i'm i'm interested in it and i i was leaving work picking up my kid kind of half listening and it was super interesting so i'm gonna i'm definitely gonna have to go back and maybe just create the brain model like as you're doing it just to start developing those neural pathways because i haven't done that yet either and even though i've been wanting to well, and the challenge, I guess, is you can do it on any topic. You don't have to do it on something I'm doing it on just because it's my interest doesn't have to be your interest. But the thing is this. You get yourself the, the, the free software, the personal brain. You create a model. And then the blank thing is staring you in the face. Enter one thought. That's all it's asking. Enter one thought. Put in one topic you think you know about. And then put that in and now try to build it out in the model. And you're going to find how superficial even this thing you thought you knew about wow, there's a lot I don't know about this. And then that, that stuff you don't know about, it's now on your radar. You might not know about it yet, but you know it exists, and you might have to look at it at some point. And then at some right. point you do. And this is how your knowledge grows out. And it's a really cool organic process. It's nonlinear. Your brain loves it, and it's useful. So that's, that's how I've been able to do it for the past 11 years, not by like scheduling time to do the thing. I do it because it's useful. So I don't every, not every week I'm putting stuff into it, but when I'm doing things where I'm internalizing and trying to learn, then I am taking the time to put it in the history blueprint so I can recall it later and to be able to have much more granularity on how I came to my own thinking and opinions and ideas or observations or perspectives, not so much opinions. I don't find those useful, but tracking uh and organizing the knowledge that i'm putting in front of myself or putting through my brain i find it to be efficacious yeah and you can go back at any point you know something happens and you need to you feel like you need to go back to it each one of those thoughts can develop into a, you know hundreds of others each one of them dep depending on where you're going and yeah you might come across something in your, it, you know, just creating the tree of some random thought. And then all of a sudden you got to create a whole new brain to deal with that one issue, which well, I like, yeah, I lost a bunch of uh, brains that I was messing around with the last time. I now that'll, that'll happen too. You know, no, it'll no. take a couple different models before you find the right one that really gets your passion. But like if, uh, if somebody's uh, likes chopping wood, you could learn the history of a knife or an axe or a saw and the different types of saws, different types of axe heads. People from different countries had different strategies to crack wood open. All those, just that simple interest, you would learn so much about the history. And then guess what? Other people would probably appreciate learning that because there's a lot of people out there spending money on those types of things or learning how to use them safely and want to know the history. So anything you, my point is this, if you have a passion enough to learn it, there are other people who have a passion enough to learn about it as well. And it's not everybody that might share your passion for the unique niche area, right? But that could be a hobby of yours. It doesn't have to be your on all your, your full-time entrepreneur endeavor. But those passions and the, the, the ability to take action on the things you want to get, that's also a function of knowing how to get what you want from the resources in the world. And you get that by providing value to other people, right? The Which notion is why is, YouTube is so popular. <laughs> it is, but it's not interactive. So there's limitations. It's good for some things, but it's not so good at the other parts that make the rest of the things work, right? So um, what they should be used, not, I don't like to use obligatory language. Look at that. What could be done on YouTube is for people to just illustrate 
simple topics. Like the simple topic that addresses a lot of needs for people is when they're looking for more income and they think they need a job or this sort of thing. It's like, it's just an attitude. It's a perspective. The, the way you make money come easily into your life is by helping money come easily into the lives of others, e.g. providing value or utility or helping them increase their profit or their efficiency, right? That's the business world. It's not uh, a different thing in the social or private world. It's just a different uh, mechanization of the same concepts. What makes things move around without friction? What are the things that cause friction and entropy in the system? So it gets back to the animate and the inanimate, uh, not in specific, but in general terms of what you're, what you're describing uh, as you read that book is his uh, attempt to describe the known universe and our internal faculties of perceiving that known universe, which is a hard thing to do with only 24 to 26 characters, <laughs> some spaces. To, to be able to write down in words ideas that are so big they take up eternity and infinity in the coding. Anyone else with uh, time to chime on this episode of History Connected? I don't even know what time it is. How long we've been doing this? Oh, about an hour and a half. Or about two hours at this point probably. Alright, so I'm going to wrap it up right here. We have today gone through uh, the articles, the Harvard basis for the story and the life history of William Sidus. We've connected that into the popular movie from 1998, Good Will Hunting, and its authors, Ben Affleck and Matt Damon. We've taken that story back to real life to connect William Sidus, who is Good Will Hunting, uh, to his, uh, his dad, Boris Sidus, his mom, uh, Sarah Sidus, both uh, psychologists at Harvard and uh, the mistreatment through their intentional uh, neglect or an in unintentional neglect you want to put it um, their ineffective ethics they try to do good but it has ill effects on their son um, and he grows up to write a book that is recognized by recognized geniuses decades later as being a substantial contribution many years ahead of its time so why does someone like that then find themselves in kind of a lackluster rest of their life of menial jobs and struggle to find any sort of success and thrive in the world when clearly they're one of the most intelligent people ever to walk the earth. Could it be that some of those uh, contradictions hold people up regardless of intelligence, the learned helplessness? Even though you could be a smart learner, you might not be able to learn how to make yourself successful in a system that already exists. So there's uh, adapt, evolve, overcome abilities of resourcefulness. There's work ethic that if it's not being externally pushed, maybe Sidus didn't have a whole lot of motivation without two parents poking and prodding him to do stuff. Maybe he never had that internal self-resourcefulness uh, faculty, or maybe he did have that, and that's how he was able to you know, give a middle finger to MIT and say, I'm not going to work for the government giving you the solutions to questions you guys can't answer so you can go kill people on the other side of the world and like drain the economy and resources out of this country why should he do that right that's the club of baby seal scene and so bringing that all full circle there is in existence this theory of reserve energy it is poorly uh, identified and defined which i think is an opportunity for those who are interested in developing such concepts, and maybe if you did a little research on such a concept, you reach out to someone like David Goggins, I'm sure that would be a pretty pretty interesting interview to get his, uh, his feedback, where he thinks it might be true, where he thinks it might be false, how he thinks he might access that energy, all those sort of things I'm sure DARPA and the government are planning on asking him anyway. But it should be known to the civilian world, too, because as uh, even William James said, it's a faculty that's available to all living organisms. So if you are a living organism of some sort, you apparently have access to energy, uh, reserve energy. And whether or not it's really energy or prana or whatever name you want to call it, it is what you know as the second wind, the third wind, the fourth wind, the rocky get up off the canvas when, you know, Apollo Creed thinks he's down for the count. That's what reserve energy is all about the ability to call upon it in a situation in life so you can do the thing that you need to get done so a couple of different a couple of different lessons and all this was thank uh thanks courtesy to youtube censoring the 
the former video from 10 years ago on the origins of goodwill hunting and due to that censorship we now have an episode of history connected in the can ready for publication next thursday all right so for all of you that are tuning in today from the autonomy course thank you guys for tuning in and not dropping out and for those of you watching this next week on youtube uh if you're interested in improving yourself and learning some life skills that also help you think your way through the the maze uh, of craziness that's out there in the real world there's uh, purposely limited ideas so that you can limit your potential if you're interested in unlimiting your potential uh, check the link in the description under this video and with that being said thank you guys all have a wonderful day and the next meeting for tonight is uh, empathic communication I think it's been canceled this evening so for those of you watching live check the uh, the announcements for the next meeting tomorrow peace Thank <laughs> you.